It's not a quality of withholding. It is not a quality of punishing. It's not a quality of aggression. It's a comfort. It's a forbearance. It's a release and a relief. Now, I was recently asked by a Muslim organization called the Ring of Knowledge, what is a good response to, the, to combat the misconception that Islam is a violent religion or that the Quran contains injunctions for violence? I replied, the story of the conquest of Mecca. So at the end of the year 629 in the Christian calendar, we see something significant take place, the conquest of Mecca. Just eight years earlier, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam When this many people in the room, we should bring down the roof with our salam. Let your heart feel that. This is a day to honor the Holy Prophet and to be enlivened by this love. Let your voice reflect that. Now just eight years earlier, the Holy Prophet had left as a wanted man, a besieged man, attacked. But upon his return to Mecca and his removal of the idols, we see that this event turned out to be unprecedented and mercy flowed from the lips of this noble prophet, may peace and blessings be upon him. He entered that city in humility, not arrogance, not in this proud arrogance of a victor, right? No, he came speaking in low tones, reciting the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving thanks, extolling the oneness of Allah, the oneness of God. Now the prophet appeared at the threshold of the Kaaba, and he surveyed the crowd in front of him. He addressed them with these words. There is no God but Allah. He is one and all alone, and he has no partners. All praise and thanks to him. He has fulfilled his promise. He has helped his slave to victory, and he has dispersed the gains of his enemies. And then, towards the end of his speech, the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, and citing from the Holy Quran, he said to those who he had conquered, there is no blame on you today. There is when we look at the historical account by Abu al Azad, he says, and I quote, the Prophet declared a general amnesty in Mecca. The amnesty extended even to the apostates. He forbade his army to plunder the city or to seize anything that belonged to the Quraysh tribe. Now this Quraysh tribe had left nothing undone to compass his destruction and the destruction of Islam. But in his hour of triumph, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he excused all their transgressions and crimes. That is an incredible mercy. That shows a quality of character where the ego is humbled before its Lord where that person who's in a position of ultimate power doesn't need to oppress someone to keep that power because that power is given by Allah and none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is mercy to mankind and that's what the Prophet would do. As your master of ceremonies this afternoon, I'm going to begin with an introduction of the Reverend Dr. L.L. L. DeBril. She is the pastor of Faith United Church in Christ, of Christ in Union, New Jersey, here in your state. Now, I want you to get a picture of what it would be like if you were to visit her church. And perhaps you ought to go, just to have that experience of understanding another faith community and seeing how things can happen. You would be struck by the warmth, the joy, and the welcoming environment that she has created to ensure that all parishioners of every age, ethnicity, and background know that they have a place there. That's what she does. The Reverend Dr. Debril strives to establish Christ's compassion in action in her congregation. And this congregation is welcoming, it's inclusive, 
They bring the liturgy and worship in variety of forms. In other words, they don't stick to some traditions exclusively. This is a lesson for us. And what else do they do? They sing hymns, not just in English, but in other languages. They observe communion, which is one of the sacred sacraments of the church, not as an individual only, but sometimes they change it up and they do it as a group, to have an experience as a community receiving communion. Look at that thought process that goes into creating a congregation that is vibrant and meaningful and is constantly being attuned to the needs of its parishioners. That's pretty awesome. Now what's vital about her approach is the keen vision that she has not to allow structure or form to supersede meaning and the true purpose of worship. Now in fact, it's good for us to learn what her church stands for. Let this be a lesson for us today to understand this different denomination. So the United Church of Christ stands for this and this comes from their literature. It says, and this, they talk in the first person, which I find interesting in the literature. But that's, this is what they say. They say, my roots go back 2,000 years, but I am very much now and today. I am not strict with tradition or dripping in rituals. I like those words. And my open-armed approach is appealing to people of all races and lifestyles, so congregations are diverse and unique. And this is what they say. The funny thing is, when you're less judgmental, you allow people to search, discover, and flourish. How about that? Yes, let's have an amen for that. Amen. 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 Allowing people the dignity to find their way in their faith. Not imposing rituals on them and checking on them to see if they've accomplished these rituals. Yes? Now, here's what the church says. My friends come to me to seek their own answers, look inside themselves, and explore their spiritual lives. In the end, my personality is reflective of Christ. Open, embracing, nurturing, and eternally relevant. Now, that's not all she does. She currently uh, serves at the request of the Senators Raymond Lesniak and Tom King Jr. with what's called FLAVE, Faith Leaders Against Violence. As a coalition of religious leaders to combat, combat violence in the name of religion. And she also is active in the Municipal Alliance and the Community Relations Commission for the Township of Union. Now, Dr. Grill is a graduate of Rutgers University. Welcome home to your alma mater. And that's true of Imam Zay Shakur as well. Welcome back to your alma mater. Now, she's also graduated from New Brunswick Theological Seminary and has worked professionally in theater in business and as a public educator. And what's fascinating is I'm sure she brings some of that panache for the theater to the creativity she brings to her congregation. She really works tirelessly for social justice, for interfaith understanding, and if you have a look at the church's website, you see it's replete with examples of all types of relevant missions and work to serve humanity, from things like Habitat for Humanity, from work across the globe with other church world service projects, domestic violence campaigns, outreach to the Native American community, and there are many more. But you will see that it's an active and vibrant community led by this wonderful reverend who we welcome to our stage with a loud salawat and Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Reconnected. I hadn't thought 
not much about Katie in the last 40 years since I've seen her, but I'll tell you, in the last two years, we have become so close. First of all, because we are cousins and we share blood. But secondly, because we share passions and interests. And for me, primarily because we are so very different, living in different places, that we delight in each other and learning things such as the delicacy of miktak, which is pickled whale blubber. No. But I'm learning about my cousin. I'm no longer sitting and wondering, but I'm also learning about her issues. The Athabascan natives of Alaska have been abused and oppressed by the United States government and the Russian government before them. And in the name of religion, many of them were taken away from their native culture. Such things as subsistence living, I have learned about. And Katie is the first woman chief of her Ruby village. And the other night I watched her on the internet speak to the Tanana chiefs about their issues in schools and hunting and fishing. I love my cousin. And the more I know about her, the more excited I am to know more. The more I respect her, the more I find we are family. And so today, you are my cousins. ago we shared a common ancestor. The spiritual fire of that ancestor still flows in our veins. The same fire. But our lives have diverged. Our traditions have diverged. We have different ways of worship and dress and living and it is all so wonderful I cannot believe how good God is to us, his children. When I learn more and more about my cousins, you and other faith traditions in our family, I'm amazed at how much we have in common, and I'm also delighted by our differences. This is one of my major passions in life today celebrate, as the United Church of Christ would say, to celebrate our diversity, but to find unity. Now, I get invited to strange places, such as the State House in Trenton, New Jersey, and to little farmhouses in Lambertville, to speak my passion. So my honor today is to speak to you. First of all, who am I? I'm of Irish-German descent, a lifelong Christian, but the United Church of Christ does not hold itself as having the only answer. We celebrate every faith tradition, and we celebrate all people's relationships with their creator. And so we have a passion for exploring our cousins and finding out delightful differences between us and then celebrating the unity of our faith. I, as you heard, have my roots in theater. I have my master's in theater from Rutgers Mason Gross. So I tend to be a little um, yeah, dramatic, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say it myself. But that's what it takes sometimes to impress upon people the importance of what we're saying here today. I am angry at the years that my cousin and I wasted getting to know each other, and I am angry with a righteous anger at the benign ignorance of people in this country and around the world who don't take us seriously, who don't try 
to understand, they might not actively discriminate, but they don't actively work for justice. And so the first of those two words, righteousness, is very important. You cannot be a righteous person unless, first of all, you are in right relationship with your Creator. And that leads to being in right relationship with each other. A relationship of agape love, a relationship of compassion and understanding and deeply caring for each other. And righteousness leads to justice. Now you will find me in Trenton many times annoying the legislators and making speeches in Judiciary Senate rooms to work for justice, but you're also likely to find me in the library or in the post office where I hear a casual, slightly bigoted remark made by somebody, and I can't let it pass. Because if we let things pass, we are helping hatred win. If we look at the massacre of French comedic writers, and don't look at the ghetto that produces desperation and kills hope, that tells young people they're not worthy to be educated. And if in the name of our religious tradition or my religious tradition, we tell those young people of France, those Muslim youngsters, that they cannot participate in society, if we don't point to that, make people uncomfortable by doing that, then we are letting hatred win. We are letting injustice thrive. So if there's one thing that you need to know about me is I'm a little round old lady, but I'm a preacher. I don't have a whole lot of power, but I'm loud and I'm fearless and I don't care if when I stick my neck out and get my head handed to me, because I will not be part of that which ignores or fosters ignorance and hatred in my neck of the woods. I can't go solve the world's problems. I'm old, I'm little. And God forgive me in many cases, the fact that I'm a woman works against me. But what I can do is form relationships that lead to justice. I can't save the whole world, but I can have a relationship with one or two other people. And as it is echoed in all of our faith traditions, to have for the exchanging of emails so that together, even though we can't stop Boko Haram, oh, I have Nigerians in my congregation. I have Filipinos. I have people from Liberia and Cameroon. I have people from Haiti and San Martin of Puerto Rico. I can't go to those places, but I can be where I am, seeking equality and relationship and justice. And I beg of you today, Find a way to raise your voice. I beg of you today to find a way in the name of faith to speak out. And if you are not a preacher, not all of us are, support those who will preach. If you are not a lawmaker, talk to those who are. If you're not a caregiver or a nurturer, tenderly and gently nurture those who are. And my cousins, my friends, we can save the world.